Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and how would you like to take your OK marriage and turn it into a great marriage? Well, you've come to the right place if that's what you're looking for, because today on Facebook Live, I'm going to be tackling the subject, how to make an OK marriage into a great one. As I say, my name's Andrew G. Marshall. I'm a marital therapist with 30 years experience. And what I've got for you is seven really quite big things that you can do to change your marriage and turn it from an okay one into a great one. And I've also got four or five um, sort of more ordinary ones um, that are going to be easier for you to do as well. So welcome to this Facebook Live. And if you're watching, please do say hello and please post a question as well because it's really important um, that you give me the feedback as well because I want to answer your questions. So um, I'm going to say hello to Sarah who's actually watching at the moment and as you come on board start thinking about some questions you might like to ask on our topic of make an okay marriage into a great one. Um, if I don't have a chance to deal with all of them I will post answers as well on, the, the, on Facebook later. So let's look at some of those um, really big changes you can make um, that actually um, are not so big, but they will make a huge difference. I may also have to say hello to Madeline, who's joined us as well. Now, the first one, if, I, if you take only one idea away from this broadcast, I'd like it to be this one. Um, and the most important way of keeping your marriage a great marriage is don't confuse family time with couple time. Now, the problem is that you do an awful lot of things with the, as a family. There's you, your partner, the children, you go out on some great days and you think you're really close and you are close as a family. But actually, how much interaction is there between you and your partner, you and your husband or you and your wife? Because actually what cements a marriage is, yes, family time. But what you need is couple time, and by that I mean the time just the two of you. It could be um, stroking each other's feet as you watch the TV, or it could be actually going out on a date together. But lots of times when I have people who look back over their marriage and try to understand why it collapsed, is they suddenly realise that what they thought was great together time was actually family time rather than couple time. So don't make that mistake. Must say hello to Karen as well. If you've got a question for me, please do feel free to ask it. Now, the next one that is really important is to share the initiation of sex. Now, the problem is often in most relationships, there's one partner who is always responsible for sort of saying, hello, here I am, let's be intimate together. Um, and if you're not particularly comfortable with uh, initiating sex, that's okay. But the problem is your partner gets the message that you don't fancy him or her, because if they've always actually got to do all the legwork, they can feel, well, actually, I'm not that attractive. And that really does hit on your self-esteem and your feeling of attractiveness. And if you want to have a great marriage rather than an okay marriage, initiate from time to time. Um, there's lots of different ways of initiating. Um, look at some of my books, I can explain some of those. But do make certain that you show your partner that you're actually interested in him or her. You're not just responding to his or her desire. Um, a good way of actually getting more into that mood is to touch each other more. That would be another thing that um, I think is incredibly important. It's very easy to get into a situation where you think, well, if I stroke my partner's feet, as I said a few moments ago, he or she will think it's actually sex time. And if all physical contact turns into sex, that tends to make your relationship very one dimensional. Um, Karen says that stress is a huge libido basher. And I agree with you. It is really difficult um, when you're stressed. But um, it's also good to be actually able to talk to each other and say, how can we be less stressed? How can we actually transform our relationship from that running 10, 10 million miles a day into something relaxed? And finding a way of actually easing the foreplay in. So one of the ways of initiating sex um, that would also be very good at actually reducing your stress is for the two of you to have a bath together. 
Um, it's one of the most beautiful things you can do together. And in fact, one of the couples I had who had the best sex life, although they'd been together for 20 years, had a bath together every single day. They used it to chat over the day, but actually often they would go from washing each other's hair into something far more intimate. So that's a very good way of de-stressing and initiating, because you're actually saying, let's have a bath together. My third idea to make an okay marriage into a great one is to argue more. Now, this is going to sound really weird. How can you have a great marriage if you argue a lot? Well, one of the biggest causes of people falling out of love is suppressing their feelings. And they start off by suppressing the unpleasant and the unwelcome feelings like irritation and anger and just being generally sad and fed up. The problem is, if you start sh switching off one feeling, you can't actually pick and choose. You end up switching off all the feelings, including the positive ones. The great thing about an argument is that it brings all the issues up to the surface. You actually, instead of burying stuff, actually have a chance to sort it out. I'm not suggesting you pick fights, but next time you get somebody um, giving you an invitation for some conflict, you don't just sort of walk away or duck it. You say, I'm upset too. Can we talk about this? Let's have this out. You can have a positive argument. Arguments are really healthy and good for your relationship. So if you argue, don't worry. The couples that always worry me the most are the ones who come to me and say, I never argue. And I'm going to say hello to Simona now as well. Nice to have you on board too. Um, if you'd like to ask me a question on the subject of making an okay marriage into a great one, I'll be tackling them all at the end of the session. Um, so, so far we've got how to make an okay marriage into a great one. Don't confuse family time with couple time. Share the initiation of sex. Argue more. And accept each other as you are. Now that's my fourth one. Accept each other as you are. Now, there was once a Broadway musical which was called I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change. And whenever I tell people that title, they always laugh because it's just so true. We fall in love with somebody, we think they're absolutely wonderful, but we just have this project. We'd like them to be, in my case, my partner would like me to be tidier. I'm terrible at it. I do try, but I'm terrible at it. What are the things that you would like your partner to be better at? What are the things you'd like to change? The problem is, if you're always being thought as a work in progress to be improved, that doesn't actually make you feel very loved. And this is the most extraordinary thing, is often when we accept people as they are, and you know they're not a talker, or they're somebody who finds arguments difficult, then that's the time they're beginning to change. So you're not saying, oh, you must argue more with me, but you're actually encouraging them to talk more, you're listening to their viewpoints, you're making things easier for them to argue, but you're just accepting that, um, that they are the way they are. So let's go on to the fifth one. Now, this is a, a really interesting one. I think I must actually um, move on to one of the, um, the questions actually at this point um, because it ties in with my next point. Um, Karen wants to know how to open up and get better communication. Now, one of the reasons people don't talk to us is something to do with my fifth reason in uh, a, a way of improving your marriage. And that is, I want you to believe that every word your partner says is true. Now, what do I mean by that? To your partner, what they say is true in their world. Okay. The problem is they say, Andrew, you're really untidy. And if I'm not careful, I will start bracketing that because I will either say, yeah, um, my partner thinks I'm untidy, but I'll put a bracket around it. Yeah, I'm not that bad or that's not true, or yes, but I emptied the dishwasher yesterday. But what I'm not actually doing is accepting that every word is true. And if for a moment you actually do think, is every word true, is what my partner says of, but that, for example, I spend too much time on my iPhone, or I'm too focused on the children and I forget about him or her, 
actually if that's true and from where they're sitting it is what do i want to do differently and it's important to get that better communication with this thing because if you actually give your partner the respect of saying actually i don't discount what you're saying yep yeah, let's talk about it let's see what we can do about it that encourages them because they're not actually going to be slapped down and told yes but or you're wrong or coming up with the one example like i said with the time i did tidy something up so that's my fifth thing that you can do to make a big difference to make an okay marriage into a great marriage so what's number six i'm afraid we're back to sex again because sex is the glue that holds a relationship together and the thing that you can do is you can plan for sex. Now, everybody always says to me in my counselling room when I say, well, you can plan for sex, they say, but yes, spontaneous sex is better. And I agree with you. It is absolutely wonderful when both of you feel in the same mood at the same time and you have sex together. That's brilliant. The problem is the couples that work on spontaneous sex actually both spontaneously feel sexy once on holiday, once at Christmas and once on Valentine's Day. And you can't run a relationship on sex three times a year. If you plan for sex, you actually say, well, we're going to go to bed early tomorrow night. One, you've got a chance to look forward to it. And number two, um, you're actually building it in on a regular kind of basis. You're saying that it is important for us to be intimate together. Now, my definition of sex is not just intercourse. It could be that you don't actually, when you get there, actually feel like intercourse. But I promise you, you're never too tired to give to receive a nice massage or to give the other person a massage. Um, you're never too tired to have a bath and wash each other's hair together. You can do intimate things. That counts as sex as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't just have to be intercourse. There's lots of other things you can do. And if the worst comes to the worst, you can take a rain check as long as you rebook and that you plan that rebook and you follow through on that rebook. Now, back to how to open and open up and communicate better. This one was a question from Karen. Um, don't forget, if you have got a question for me here on Facebook Live, all you have to do is type it in and I'll answer it at the end of the section. So my seventh idea for making a really big contribution to changing the way you communicate and turning an okay marriage into a great marriage is to talk sideways. Now, what do I mean by that? When you're talking face to face with somebody, and in particular, if you've actually set up a particular session where the two of you are going to be together and you're going to talk about your problems, it becomes very heavy it's very easy for one of you to get stuck and to feel overwhelmed and disappear out of it. So what I suggest you do is you talk sideways. Now, how does talk sideways actually work? Well, if the two of us, look here, here I have in my hand is, a, is my partner. If we're in the car together, we are going to be talking sideways because one of us can have our attention on the road. And even if you are the passenger, you tend to look ahead at the road. So it's not quite so confrontational when you're actually both like that. There's also the natural pauses while you just sort of stop and work out whether you're going to turn right or left at the next junction. And you're in this place so you can come back to the conversation. It's far less threatening. You can have some pauses, some time to think about it without one of you going off and doing something entirely different. Um, another way of um, talking sideways is actually doing something together. That is a wonderful thing to do to make an okay marriage into a great marriage anyway, is to do things together. They don't have to all be exciting things. You know, it could be just doing the garden together. And um, while um, I'm digging the hole for the plant to go into and you're putting the water in, we can be having this conversation. We're not actually looking to each other in a great um, face to face confrontation. So, you know, you're sanding down some wood together. You're doing a job together. Um, it makes it much quicker if the two of you do it together and you can talk. So I said I'd give you seven big things that you can do to make an OK marriage into a, 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 a great one. The first one is don't confuse family time with couple time. 
The next thing is share the initiation of sex. The third one, the one that always surprises people, is argue more. Um, I at one point used to say, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and an argument a day keeps the marital therapist away. Um, next, I'd like you to accept the other partner as they are, rather than trying to change them. Believe every word your partner says is true, plan for sex, and talk sideways. So, I will come to, I've got four much smaller things you can actually do to um, improve on your marriage and turn it from a great one, uh, from an okay one into a great one in a moment. But uh, let me start looking at some of your questions because um, I have to thank various people who sent me in questions. So, the first one um, is... I'm interested in whether it's a good idea to raise those long-term, slow-burning issues if you're basically happy and doing okay. Well, I would say that that is the very best time to raise an issue. When you're doing okay, go for it. Because when you're doing okay, you're actually in a receptive mood. You can actually do the things that build agreement so that as you're talking about it and your partner makes a good point, you can say, oh, yeah, that's a good point. You know, or you always make good points. That's why I really like talking to you about these things. When you've got this sort of positive viewpoint, you're actually able to talk about those issues. When you're in a difficult place and you've actually got four days worth of niggles that are building up, the likelihood is uh, on the fifth day, this long, slow burning issue is going to explode out because, you know, you're now getting it all out. Um, so we've got not only the four days worth of niggles, but we've got the huge um, subject as well. And whereas you can probably deal with one niggle at a time or one slow burning issue at a time, you can't deal with a whole load of issues at a time. So raise them when you're basically happy and doing OK. I know you don't want to spoil the situation, but actually ducking issues is a short-term positive and a long-term problem. So, I've got another question here. Um, uh, let's see, how to, oops, I pressed the wrong button. How to deal with the frustrations of husband traveling overseas without it becoming too emotive and ending in tears and storming out? Oh, you um, have my 100% um, sympathy on that. That one is really difficult, spending a, a lot of uh, time apart. Um, what I would say is um, you need to sort of build in a way that you can still feel together even when you're apart. So I think that um, the, 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 the first thing to say about how to do that is a lot of people find that the new technology and FaceTime is incredibly important. And it's very easy to do that FaceTime incredibly late, right at the very end of the day, when you're absolutely exhausted. I know that when I've been apart from my partner, that's been one of my problems, and I'm sort of too tired to do it. So you really do need to make certain you're doing that, that you're texting a lot of the time when you're, when you're apart. Emotional issues. If it's emotional, you have to acknowledge that emotion. You have to actually say, you know, I find it really difficult when you're apart. I love you a lot and this is difficult for me. Because when you actually acknowledge it and it's up front and actually said, we don't actually get to the point of the tears and the storming out. Um, and that you can actually hear his stuff that actually he just doesn't like being away as well. So that you're actually listening to him. So... Um, I would also try and build in ways that you can actually be together during that long time. Is it actually possible for the whole family to come out? It might be expensive, but it really is important. Is it possible for him to come back at one point? It is difficult, but it really helps um, you to be able to get, to, to get that in there. I hope that's helpful, but please do acknowledge the feelings. So... Um, so, yep, I've just had a, somebody saying that WhatsApp is helpful. The end of the day is the crucial time. Yep, but don't make it so late that you're absolutely going all the time. That was my problem. And apparently he's sitting here with Karen at the moment. So what I would say is, 
I'll tell you what, we'll move on to some of the things that you can actually do together now. So these are some small things. Um, and the next, uh, the, so I've got four of these, he says trying to count. And the first one is look at each other more. Now, this is something that Karen and her husband could actually do because couples in love spend 75% of their time when they're talking, looking at each other. The rest of us only spend 30 to 60% of our time looking at our partner when we're talking. The temptation is to not look up from your emails because you've just got to get them done when your partner comes back and you don't actually turn and look and say, hi, guess what? My partner's just come back. Um, but, um, and look into your partner's eyes, give them a kiss. Make certain that those comings and goings are really good. The second one of these things is getting your ratio of positive strokes correct. You need to have five positives to undo one negative. So these positives can be really small, like a post-it, for example, you can put somewhere that they're going to find it. So if your partner's going to be away, put a note in their, in their suitcase for them. Um, it shows that you're thinking. Small presents are really good, like um, bringing a nice cake home with you. Um, thank you texts, sexy texts. You want to try and get five positive interactions to one negative interaction. So a negative interaction would be not saying hi when they, uh, when they come home or going like that. that. Now we need to have five positives to undo that. My third thing that you can do that's simple and easy is get some good habits going because habits automatically become part of your day. So, for example, eating together. If you're talking on WhatsApp, talking on WhatsApp each evening, don't let the children interrupt you when you're talking to each other. They might be coming rushing in, but you say, hang on a second, mummy and daddy are talking, we're just going to finish this and your children wait 30 seconds. It actually says to your partner, you're important to me. That's a good habit to have. And my fourth thing I would say about how to turn a great marriage into, a, sorry, an okay marriage into a great marriage would be to keep up all these things. The problem is we start them and we do them for three days, but in my experience, it takes three to four weeks for these things to actually kick in and to really be noticed. So start well and keep going. Let's see if I've got some more questions to answer. Uh, right. Um, I found your books really inspiring and feel like there's a lot of room for improvement for us. Interested to hear your thoughts on what a really strong marriage looks like after seven years plus kids. And there's a bit, there is a bit more to this, if I can actually manage to get it. Um, yeah, what can we aspire to? Seven years plus kids. Well, the first thing to say is you're actually through the hardest part of it because the when you have two children under five, that is really difficult. It's a real libido killer um, because just as your body is getting back to normal after having the first child, um, that you have the second child generally. It normally takes about 18 months to get to the point where you're no longer... When you've had children, as you'll probably know, you don't actually feel spontaneously horny. You can be recruited, but you don't feel spontaneously horny. During that time, your husband or partner can feel that you're not interested in him or her. So that having two children under five is the biggest passion killer. So you've got that behind you. Um, the thing that I would really say is what is inspiring is that you are dedicating your time, some time together that belongs to just you. That um, you are carving out bits of day that belong to you. That bath together is sacred time. The children knock on the door and you say, wait, we'll be out in a moment. Because 99 times over 100, they don't need you that very second and they can wait a couple of minutes. So I think what looks good if you've been together for seven years is two things, carving out that time for each other and making certain you're getting those positive strokes in five to one negative um, 
sort of count them up. Think back over the day, how many positives did we have? You know, how many negatives did we have? So, uh, yes, finding so much, so, uh, I'm having somebody agreeing with me, yes, finding life so much better with nearly school age kids. Yep. And get the dividend from that. The temptation is to think, oh, I've now got more time. I can bake more cakes for the children or I can be, I can help out and read at the school. Yeah, those are all great things to do. But personally, I'd much rather you spent more time with your partner that you actually said, I lo still love you. Yep, yeah, we've had children, but that doesn't mean we're going to ignore each other. Um, or if we have ignored each other, uh, I'm sorry we haven't had as much time for each other, but I think we've reached a really good time now. And my commitment is to actually for us to spend more time together because actually I want to be with you. I didn't just choose you to have children with. I love you and I want to be with you. So I hope that you found these ways really helpful and that they're going to help your OK marriage turn into a great marriage. Let me just go through all my points just one more time very quickly. The big ones, don't confuse family time with couple time. If you take away one thing from that, please take that away. Share your share of initiating sex. Argue more. It brings issues up to the surface rather than leaving them all um, in the resentment drawer. Accept each other as you are for with all their glory. Um, um, believe every word your partner says is true because as far as he or she is concerned it is true plan for sex and talk sideways we've got a difficult issue bring it up when you're in the car when you're doing something together rather than a face-to-face -face sit down um, and I've got four quickies that I want to give you that are a little bit smaller. Look at each other more. Be in the same room as each other rather than shouting up and down the stairs to each other. That was my parents' um, great failing and it's I'm afraid to say what I do too. Um, remember it's five positives to one negative. Develop good habits so you're doing them all the time. Eat together every evening. And the final one is keep it up. It takes three or four weeks to do this. Don't give up after a few days. I'm going to finish off this message by thanking you for being part of it. I'm also going to say hello to Laura, who says, I found your books wonderful and I feel I have made um, progress. So thank you for that. And also thank you to Walker Petty for saying hello. So that's it for this episode of, um, of um, Facebook Live. I'll be back again soon. If you've got some suggestions of topics you'd like me to cover, put them in the comments section under and I look forward to speaking to you very soon back here again. Nice talking to you. Bye-bye.